As a former FBI agent and chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, I had oversight of all 16 of our nation's intelligence agencies. My name is Mike Rogers. I had access to classified information gathered by our operatives, people who risked everything for the United States and our families. You don't know their faces or their names. You don't know the real stories from the people who lived the fear and the pressure. Until now. The Taliban regime was ruthless. There wasn't anything that they wouldn't do. Anytime you tried to speak to people about Christianity, you were taking a tremendous risk. There were eight individuals arrested in Afghanistan. They could be subject to the death penalty. They would drill us with questions for 10 hours at a time. The mission was rescue eight hostages in the heart of Taliban country and bring them home. Kabul's latest occupying force are Islamic fundamentalists who call themselves the Taliban. Their aim, to reshape morals and principles in their image of Islam. Afghanistan under the Taliban was a highly repressive society. The Taliban was ruling over most of the country. The Muslim Taliban government controlled most of Afghanistan and banned women from going to school or work. Women had to be accompanied by a man to walk outside and had to be covered in a veil from head to toe. The Taliban exposed the Afghan people to a horrific war that continues to this day. You also had this group of international religious extremists under bin Laden uh, who referred to themselves as Al-Qaeda and they had sought and gained safe haven in the Taliban-controlled parts of Afghanistan. They were essentially being hosted by the Taliban. It was the paramount safe haven for al-Qaeda, which was the most dangerous terrorist group on the planet at the time. The Taliban is ruling according to their conception of Islamic law, the most literal fundamentalist conception that you can possibly imagine. The Taliban regime was ruthless. There wasn't anything that they wouldn't do. These men would shoot women in the back of the head. They were the men who would beat you on the street with whips. They were the ones who were committing all the crimes against humanity in the name of Islam. The people were in dire, dire straits, and they were living in abject poverty. They were suffering under the greatest, most oppressive regime that we've seen in modern history. I mean, it makes me feel angry, but I don't want to live just to feel angry. I want to do something to change it. That's why I went to Afghanistan. In March of 2001, I moved to Afghanistan to join a relief agency called Shelter Now International. Their objective was developing small business enterprises for women and programs to teach job skills to street kids. There were a number of internationals in Afghanistan who were doing humanitarian work there who really wanted to serve the Afghan people. Over half of the population is female. And of course, in Islam, any contact with women with whom you are not related by blood outside of marriage is absolutely forbidden. And so just from a humanitarian standpoint, 
yeah, there was a, a very important role that uh, female humanitarian workers would have in a place like Afghanistan. You know, my plan was to be there forever. I bought a one-way ticket. I wrote my will. I told my parents where to bury my body if I was killed. That motivation to make a difference in the world was a big factor in choosing Afghanistan. I wanted to go to a place where the need was great. There were a lot of NGOs that were active in Afghanistan, including Christian NGOs. And in Afghanistan, as elsewhere around the world, particularly in the Muslim world, they were very, very careful only to do humanitarian activities and not to get involved in proselytizing because it's a crime in the Muslim world. Shelter Now was not set up as a Christian organization, but the people who worked for Shelter Now were all Christians. So as they would establish relationships with these Afghans, they would begin to tell them about Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera. Did you go there with the mission of sharing the word of God, or did you go there to help people? It was both. We'd, we couldn't do one without the other. In an Islamic culture, Talking about religion or faith is usually the first conversation that comes up. So it was much more of a kind of a natural flow of life and relationships. It wasn't like, let's go in and take out our Bible and say, you know, you have to become a Christian. On August 3rd of 2001, we were scheduled to visit an Afghan home. It was the home of a family we'd known for a long time. And they had requested to watch a movie about the life of Jesus. How did the people know about the film in the first place? When we would have a trusted relationship with an Afghan who seemed to be interested in spiritual conversations, we would let them know we have a movie about Jesus, and we'd ask them if they'd want to see it. It was a very stupid thing for them to do, no question about it. Anytime you tried to proselytize, tried to speak to people about Christianity, you were taking a tremendous risk. The film was about two hours. The film wrapped up. I packed up my stuff, and I came out about 30 minutes late, so when I got in the taxi, I asked him, how much extra do I owe you? And he looked at me in the rearview mirror with a look of utter terror in his eyes. And then a man dressed in civilian clothes got in the back seat with me. And at that point, I realized these men, they've come for me. There were eight individuals arrested in Afghanistan. Four of them were Germans. Two of them were Australians, a man and a woman, and then there were the two American women. All eight individuals from the shelter now international. Their intention was to make an example of Christians working in Afghanistan, doing anything to undermine the Islamic State. According to, to the Taliban law, they could be subject to the death penalty. They might potentially have been beheaded. Taliban is ruling according to their conception of Islamic law, the most literal fundamentalist conception that you can possibly imagine. The Taliban regime was ruthless. There wasn't anything that they wouldn't do. There were eight individuals arrested in Afghanistan. All eight were in shelter now international. Under Islamic law, the crime for proselytizing was death. After we were arrested, they walked us into this compound, and when they opened the door, there standing in front of us were about 35 to 40 Afghan women. And that was the first time I broke down and cried. In 2001, I was the CIA station chief in Islamabad, Pakistan 
where I had responsibility for all intelligence gathering operations in both Pakistan and Afghanistan. In August of 2001, we first got word that uh, these eight individuals, including two young Americans, had been arrested by Taliban security in Kabul. The U.S. Embassy procured the assistance of a Pakistani lawyer, and he is dealing with the legal authorities inside Afghanistan. But this was not an intelligence matter for us at that point. So gathering information concerning these arrestees was not high on our priority list. In fact, it, it was basically off the bottom. The cell was, uh, it was a concrete room with a concrete floor. The room was very dirty, chipped paint. I would write in my journal, I'd be sitting in the cold with a blanket. Oh Lord Jesus, I struggle so much with fear here. Every moment of every day, I battle with the fear that either a Taliban or an angry terrorist will kill me. The Taliban actually had serious evidence against these people. In fact, they had broken Taliban law. It seemed pretty clear that they were guilty. This stuff is indicating that they were indeed uh, proselytizing in Afghanistan. After we were arrested, it basically began three weeks of interrogations. They would bring in Taliban officers. I was an employee of the Ministry of Justice assigned to the investigation. I was both uh, an interpreter and also part of the delegation that was asking questions, you know? They would drill us with questions for 10 hours at a time. It was, you know, all sorts of questions, you know? It was about their job in Afghanistan, how they came into the country, and uh, why they were trying to convert Muslims into Christianity, and why they were taking advantage of the poverty of the people. One day they came in with whips, and they were going to whip us that day to get information. But there was an Afghan Talib officer who stepped in and intervened. Why did you want to help them? Because I was feeling that they shouldn't be in jail, you know? If you see somebody in a situation that is not uh, appropriate, I think you have to help. There were almost two classes of Taliban, the leaders of the regime who were in the face of evil, and then there were those who were obliged to follow the regime. We were obliged to work with the Taliban or face the consequences. They were even torture our relatives around there in our own towns. Last Sunday, their trial started in Kabul, the charge attempting to convert Muslims to Christianity. A guilty verdict could result in light punishment, deportation, as heavy as a death penalty. We were actually brought to the Supreme Court on September 8th of 2001. And there were hundreds of journalists. And that was the first time we knew anybody out in the world really knew or really cared. It was a huge international outcry from around the world. But the Taliban was trying to show the world some kind of legitimate trial, and they were preparing for that. If they brought us before the Supreme Court and said, look, we have given your people a legitimate trial, and we have brought evidence against them, and we have found them guilty, no one would be able to say anything about the punishment. Fear just really took over. It was a very scary time. And then all of a sudden, everything changed. We have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. 9-11 changed all the rules. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. 
We knew bin Laden and al-Qaeda were behind it. And Afghanistan was the paramount safe haven for bin Laden and al-Qaeda. The United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of al-Qaeda who hide in your land. When we looked at the Taliban after 9-11 in Afghanistan, we gave them choices. We said, you can join in the fight against al-Qaeda, or if you decide to stick with al-Qaeda and bin Laden, we would consider you enemies and we're going to come with lethal force. So at the same time that we're demanding all these other things, you know, he's not going to forget about these two Americans. Release all foreign nationals, including American citizens you have unjustly imprisoned. You're going to do all these other things, and by the way, you're going to turn over these foreigners as well. Either you are with us, or you are with the terrorists. When we heard that speech, we were sitting in a meeting with uh, some, you know, other like top Taliban, and they were laughing on it. The Taliban rejected our overtures to turn over bin Laden and to break away from al-Qaeda. The Taliban leadership had that opportunity, but they rejected it. And therefore, these people went from being detainees to hostages. That's the way we were thinking about it now. A plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. 9-11 changed all the rules. You are with us, or you are with the terrorists. These people went from being detainees to hostages. That's the way we were thinking about it now. Did it bother you that you had to rescue people who knowingly put themselves at risk? It doesn't matter. You're a member of our tribe. You may be stupid, you're a member of our tribe. We gotta help you. On September 11th, my parents came to the prison. We had a 30 minute supervised visit and they left the prison, went to the UN guest house and watched on the television as a second plane crash into the World Trade Center. They were evacuated the next day on the very last flight out of the country and knew that they had left their daughter in the lion's den. The hardest thing is that I'm not there with her. And if I could get back to Kabul, uh, I would go. On the night of September 17th, the Taliban came to our prison and took our entire Shelter Now team to another prison, considered a high security prison, that belonged to the intelligence department of the Taliban. Yeah, it was, it was bad, it was worse than uh, the first place. It was a concrete cell with a concrete floor, bars on the window. I had scorpions crawling in my bed covers. I had parasites. You know, there was just a lot of ailments that came from the filth in the prison and they moved us there in order to basically keep us as political prisoners. Now we knew we don't negotiate with terrorists. I mean, we understood those protocols. And to be honest, we didn't have the expectation that anybody would come and get us. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The war on terror started. It was October 7th when we heard the first bomb fall. And then the bombs just started falling repetitively. They knew there was a war on. They could hear the aircraft flying overhead. I think they had a sense that they were just small pawns caught up in a much larger undertaking. Once that attack starts, the Taliban must be saying to themselves, look, if we release these people, it's not gonna do us any good. So now it was gonna be a matter of either you, you try to bribe them out in some way, or you go in militarily 
and you get them out. JSOC is known as the Joint Special Operations Command, which is an accumulation of the top special operations units. When 9-11 happened, guys wanted at it so badly, they were dreaming it before they even knew what the dream was about. All they wanted to do was go right the wrong. And one of the first hard missions that came down was one that was referred to as Angry Talon, which was to get into Afghanistan uh, in the heart of Taliban country and rescue eight hostages and bring them home. After 9-11, I was the commander of CIA forces responsible for the intelligence collection and covert action in Afghanistan. Even in the middle of the war, deploying teams, engaging in lethal force, beginning the first armed drone strikes, we never forgot about the hostages. In fact, they remained a priority. Lord, I beg that you would spring open this door and let us go free. My heart hurts so much, I feel like I'm barely hanging on. She was a, uh, a young, very emotional girl. She would cry and she would be scared. The feeling that I had from the beginning with the detainees was you know, trying to help them. And then there was also that purpose, if we can figure out a way to keep these people safe and then eventually released without any harm. So I called the U.S. Embassy and offered to help. We did get into contact with an individual who had a natural reason to go in and out of the prison. And so we gave the satellite phone to him to communicate in real time with his CIA case officer back in Pakistan, which we hoped ultimately might help us to support a military raid to free them. Did you have a code name that the embassy gave you? Yes. What was it? It was uh, Boss. B-A-A-Z. There are many motivations that drive a foreign national to cooperate with the CIA. Uh, there's money, there's ideology, perhaps compromise, ego, revenge, coercion even. The best sources, the best collaborators, however, are doing it because they're decent people and they want to do the right thing. And that transcends cultures. We're collecting information through Afghan sources. We needed to know everything we possibly could know about the prison. When you start planning a, a hostage rescue operation, the, it, it is absolutely imperative that you get as many of the details as possible because the difference in life or death can be a fraction of a second. There is no end to the detail that they need if they're gonna launch a successful raid. We knew when we got to that prison that we were gonna have a lot of resistance on our hands. There were a ton of fortified Taliban positions within and all around that prison. And so if they know that there is a staircase that leads from the ground floor up to the, the floor where the women are being held, he needs to know how many stairs there are. He needs to know how high the risers are. You've got to have the ability to stay flexible and know when you need to deviate left or right or just completely pull back and flank. This source told us where they were being held, how they were being held, uh, how many guards there were, where the guards were, where their weapons were, what their daily routines were like. Our confidence in this one source grew as we learned more and more and basically confirmed his reporting. We, we worked very extensively on the map to rescue these eight people in Kabul. When we rehearse a mission like this, obviously you, you want to make it as realistic as possible. And so at that point, they built a mock-up of the prison and they started exercising to get these people out. The head of the JSOC liaison team came to me and he said, he said, when we train, we never give ourselves this much information. He said, I think we can get them out. As the days went on, not knowing if we would survive, it eventually just took its toll. Time stood still, 
every single hour felt like a day and every day felt like a week and every week felt like a month. There were days that it felt like we had been there literally for an eternity. I felt hopelessness. I had kind of pushed God away because I didn't understand why. I'm 24, I'm barely out of the gate, and now it's all, it's all over. We had been rehearsing for this uh, approximately two weeks, every night, and starting to define a target date that we were gonna go do the hit. It was imminent that they were gonna rescue the hostages. And then suddenly, we got an unfortunate report from our source. They began to move us so that we wouldn't be trackable. They were no longer being held 24 hours a day at that same prison. So if we had set a particular date to go and launch this raid, there was at least a decent chance that they wouldn't be there. Once the hostages had been moved to a new prison and we could no longer predict where they were going to be at any given point in time, we had to stand down on the operation. It was no longer possible to launch a rescue mission. When I look at this, I'm you know, still, still a little heartbroken uh, that we didn't get, didn't get to carry this out and do what we're chartered to do. It's a little bittersweet. It was devastating. I can't tell you how disappointed we were. And it was sort of like being on the cusp of being able to do something that you never thought you'd be able to do. And suddenly you're back at square one, starting all over again. But you have to be adaptable. Because the world isn't out there trying to help you. You have to seize the opportunities that fate presents you. I have to deal with the world as it is, not as I wish it were. A well, dramatic turn of events here in the Afghan capital, Kabul. The city behind me was, of course, a stronghold of the Taliban. Now those forces have completely abandoned it, leaving it open for the forces of the opposition Northern Alliance to move in and to take over. Suddenly, the Taliban lines north of Kabul collapse and the Northern Alliance comes rushing forward and they rush into the city. The Northern Alliance was a collection of militias basically, Tajiks, Uzbeks and, uh, and Hazaras who were uh, traditional enemies of the Taliban. The Taliban come fleeing to the south. It's complete chaos. When the Taliban were leaving Kabul, there were thousands of armed military. They had the rockets, they had, uh, you know, PK and Kalashnikovs, everything. You could feel in the air the volatility and the intensity uh, and the chaos. We heard the sound of angry men running down the hallway. And these men started to bang on the door of our prison cell. These men were dressed for war. Their heads were covered with turbans that were wrapped around their faces. All you could see were their eyes. It was very clear that these men would have no qualms with doing us harm. Witnesses say when the Taliban fled Kabul, they took with them Americans Heather Mercer and Dana Curry and six other Western aid workers. It was a very chaotic um, no man's land. And the hostages, we think, were still at, at grave risk. They were completely lost to our sight. We had no idea at that point where they might be. Taliban command and control had fallen apart. They were fleeing. 
south and to the east toward Pakistan. And the hostages, we think, were still at, at grave risk. Witnesses say when the Taliban fled Kabul, they took with them Americans Heather Mercer and Dana Curry and six other Western aid workers. They were completely lost to our sight. We had no idea at that point where they might be. We stopped in a village called Ghazni, and the Taliban put us into another prison. And we waited, and we prayed, and that was about all we could do. When the hostages had been removed from the prison in Kabul, our intelligence source, jumped in his car and started driving south with the fleeing Taliban, hoping that he could find them. What made you decide to follow the hostages? For me, it was a humanitarian and a moral duty to just save them. In Ghazni, there was fighting going on out in the street. We could hear the U.S. jets flying in and bombing the strategic Taliban strongholds. After that 15 minute silence, we heard this entourage of angry, violent men come and start breaking down the door of the prison below. This was the moment that I thought, we're dead. I was hiding under this table, just praying, God, please, please don't let them see me. Right at that moment, these men came into our cell and they started yelling, you're free, you're free. The Taliban have left and you're free. And I can't explain that moment where you're accepting that this is your fate and being offered freedom in exchange. We were so surprised. And as soon as the city calmed down and the fighting stopped, these Northern Alliance supporters uh, escorted us out of the building and we started walking through the streets. And as we were going through the old city, hundreds and hundreds of Afghans started to fall in behind us. The Northern Alliance supporters start yelling to the crowds, these were the prisoners in Kabul and we've set them free and they're dancing in the streets, shooting their guns in celebration. The whole city was celebrating freedom. And it was in that moment, all my struggling, all my wrangling with God, he wanted us to be set free with the people that we had gone to serve. It was like, God, you're so good. The Northern Alliance took us uh, to the Red Cross. And so for the moment, Dana and I felt safe. But the Taliban are still out there. We were extremely vulnerable. And so we still needed to figure out how we were gonna get out of Afghanistan. One of my officers said, the hostages are in Ghazni. In the local Ghazni office of the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC. One of my case officers, the one who is handling the source, he gets on the satellite phone with his source. And the officer says, well, where are you? And he says, I'm sitting by the road, on the ring road south of Kabul. They stole my car. And the Taliban took our, our car just with the gunpoint. Were yeah. you scared? Absolutely, we were scared, yeah. So he says, OK, I don't care how you get there. Hitchhike if you have to, but get to the Red Cross office in Ghazni. So he shoulders his bag and he starts hitchhiking and he manages to, to catch a ride heading south. And within a matter of hours, he's in Ghazni at the Red Cross office. I remember an Afghan man came to the door and said, pretend like you're going to the back of the building. So we headed towards the back and out of the kitchen, came an Afghan man dressed in civilian clothes. They were very, very happy when they saw me again. They were both like, 
because of so much happiness, they were crying. We were shocked to see him. And he wasn't wearing his Taliban clothes. He didn't have his turban. He was very clean cut. He'd shaved his beard. And he comes to me and he grabs my hand and then he grabs my wrist with his other hand. And he says, are you okay, my sister? We're fine, we're all fine. He gave us a satellite phone and he said, this is the phone number you need to call. So no sooner did I start calling the number and I turned around and he was gone. And I never saw him again. We called the number and on the other end uh, was the chief consular officer from the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan. And he said to us, tonight we're coming with helicopters to get you. We know that the best extraction point for the hostages is this airfield close to Ghazni. So we say you need to get out to this airfield. So we started grabbing a few things and started heading towards where the helicopters are coming. JSOC has to go a long way to get there. They launched the rescue helicopters and they set them flying north up toward Ghazni. We walked for about 20 minutes and the satellite phone went dead. All communication is lost and we're not gonna get it back. And so we have no idea what's happening. It was really just a wing and a prayer at that point. We walked for about 20 minutes and the satellite phone went dead. All communication is lost and we're not gonna get it back. And so we just sat there and we waited. The helicopters are now moving in and they can spot the airfield. And the rescue helicopters are trying to look for some glimmer of light out here in this sea of darkness. We've gotta light a fire. That's, that's the only option we have. So my German friend had brought a little handbag with her. And so I grabbed her handbag and I started to look for matches. And there was a box of matches in the bottom of her purse. And we took those matches out. We started taking off our headscarves, lighting them on fire. And then we just started waving the headscarves in the sky like flags, like burning flags. And the helicopters came around one more time and they saw the fire. And we knew that they had seen us because this, this massive Chinook helicopter just swoops down over our head. And all of a sudden, from across the field, out of the shadows, comes this row of GI Joes. And we hear their voices yell from hundreds of feet away. Are you the detainees? Are you the prisoners? And we're like, yes. And he says, ma'am, you're gonna be just fine. It had been complete tension. We had the expectation that we were about to save them. Suddenly it looked as though everything was lost. And now suddenly they were safely in the helicopter. It was complete relief. Once we hit Pakistan, we were transferred to a C-130 that took us to Islamabad. And as the back of the C-130 opened, standing in the middle of the runway was my father. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, very, very happy. But we sacrificed so much because of these issues. It spread out, you know, the word that, you know, I was an American spy, you know. 
And my dad was assassinated just uh, in, uh, after a year. Taliban did it. Do you regret it? No, I don't regret like helping uh, these eight people to save their life. It wasn't my choice to help them. In my speech in front of the United States Congress, I said uh, to the Taliban that one of the objectives was to release the humanitarian aid workers that were being detained against their will. We've achieved that objective. We are so excited to be back. And again, we know we're here because of the prayers of people all over the country, all over the world. It was an honor. It was an honor and a privilege to serve my country. And it was a collective effort, and not just by the CIA in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but of course with our military brothers in arms. There was a, a very brief but very intense uh, sense of, of joy. Did you meet the hostages? I never did. Once they were rescued, I was on to the next thing. Freedom is life. I don't think can really live without being free.